Hello everyone, uh, my name is Moaz and uh, I'm uh, a postdoc at NERSC. I'm currently working with the uh, application performance group. And uh, today I'll be uh, talking about the uh, GPU accelerated sequence alignment uh, algorithm and I'll take you through the different developmental stages of that. So uh, this figure over on the right, it, it has another name also known as the central dogma of molecular biology. It basically shows the basis of all the life as we know it. It all starts right here in the DNA, also known as the source code of life. Uh, DNA is composed of uh, four basic nucleotide bases and the precise combination of these bases inside the DNA uh, conveys important genetic information. This information is used for synthesizing proteins by different, uh, different uh, organisms. And these proteins are then known as the uh, machine that runs the life. And, uh, it's, it's important that we understand the sequences of the uh, bases inside the genome uh, so that we can understand the functioning of proteins better and ultimately understand the life better. Now, the process of uh, sequencing the bases inside a, inside a genome or DNA is known as genome sequencing, and, and it has like <coughs> wide range of applications. Uh, some of them are like personalized medicine, agriculture, criminal and forensic sciences, uh, studies of uh, climate change, and you just name it. Now, how does the process of genome sequencing work? Uh, it's a very holistic view, a very simplistic view of things, and things are obviously more complex, but uh, just for the sake of this presentation, let's try to understand how this thing works. So typically, we take a sample, uh, the DNA sample of the organism under consideration, and we place that into one of the NSG instruments, also known as the next generation, uh, ne next generation sequencing instruments. These instruments are able to uh, sample different parts of the DNA and give us something like this, which is like a jigsaw puzzle, like pieces of a puzzle. And the challenge is to put these pieces together to get a complete genome assembly. Now, there are software pipelines which do this for us, and there is like a large number of them out there, and most of them are using one common algorithm at the core. That is known as the Smith-Waterman alignment algorithm. What this algorithm does is it generates a dynamic programming matrix, and with the help of that, it finds out the most optimal alignment between two given sequences of DNA. And using this information, these aligners are able to stitch different parts of uh, genomes together and give us a complete genome assembly. Now, to understand how convoluted or compounded this problem of genome sequencing is, let's try to understand our environment better. Our environment is really complex. It is composed of large organisms like human beings and small org organisms like microbes. These microbes live in, in the form of colonies, small groups, and these groups form associations or symbiotic relationships with different organisms and the environment and have a real effect on, on these organisms and the, uh, the, in, the environment. So it's important to understand these organisms and the larger ones. Now, the collective g uh, genome of these smaller organisms is known as metagenome, and it can be really complex than understanding a single genome because in a typical colony, the, there are like thousands of species. For example, inside human gut, we have more than 1,000 types of organisms living which help us digest food and in, 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 uh, in return, we provide them a place to live and some nutrition. Similarly, in a gram of plant root, there is more than 10 to 11 microbial organisms present. And the, uh, the challenge is to sequence the genome of all these organisms uh, collectively. And in a typical metagenome uh, sequencing uh, like uh, pipeline, the Smith-Waterman algorithm call can be made like few billions of times. Now, previously it took a decade and about $3 billion to sequence a complete human genome. But since the technology of data generation has come a long way and today we can do the same thing in under 24 hours and in less than $5,000. So basically the bottleneck has been shifted from the data generation phase to the data processing phase. And that is why it is required that we develop optimized algorithms, especially the algorithms that are able to exploit the modern HPC infrastructure better. And uh, since the upcoming generation of HPC systems is more GPU centric, so it makes sense to develop uh, GPU optimized algorithms for this problem. And for that, uh, obviously first step would be to start off with the Smith-Waterman alignment algorithm. So before I get into the uh, GPU version that I developed, let's try to understand the algorithm better, like how does the sequential version uh, work, and uh, in this way we'll also be able to see the concurrency and uh, points where we can actually utilize GPU. 
So this is simple, like uh, this is like a simple matrix. Uh, we have a, a query sequence and a reference sequence, and we initialize the matrix uh, with zeros in the first column and the first row. And then the task is to solve this equation over here for each of the cells, where these three H represent the three dependencies which each cell will have. For example, if we want to solve uh, this equation for this yellow cell over here, we have these three dependencies. And we'll be adding the match and a mismatch score to each of these uh, cells, and then finding a maximum. And we have a zero in the equation just to make sure that the score is never negative. So in this case, uh, since we have a match, because we have uh, A from the query and we have a from a reference, so we'll be adding five. And if we had a mismatch, we'll, we'll be subtracting three from that. So. And, and the other uh, task is to keep track of where this maximum number is coming from. So we had like three cells, and this five could come from any of these three. Since we have a tie, when we have a tie, we typically take the diagonal cell. But otherwise, we point this traceback arrow towards the uh, highest scoring cell. Now, now that we have the first cell computed, you can see that we have dependencies for two more cells ready. That means we can compute these two cells of the sec second anti-diagonal uh, in, in parallel. And as we go on, you'll notice that the parallelism uh, exists only al along the anti-diagonal, and it increases as we move forward. And once we have computed the whole uh, scoring table, we find the maximum scoring cell. That is 30 over here, and that is the second step of it. And the third step is to perform a traceback starting from this highest scoring cell. And that gives us the complete, uh, that gives us the optimal alignment. And you can see that we have an upward movement in the table right over here, and that gives us this gap. And the horizontal movement right over here gives us the second gap. So in summary, we are able to achieve uh, optimal alignment of two strings using Smith-Waterman uh, algorithm. Now, before we move on to the implementation, let's put some uh, expectations into perspective. Uh, I did some runs on the Haskell node of Cori and the KNL node. Uh, for using the fastest uh, non-implementation of the same algorithm. And uh, we, we were able to perform 1 million alignment in about 36 seconds using Haskell node. Now, considering the uh, peak performance of V100 GPU and the Haskell <coughs> node, uh, we can uh, get like a theoretical idea of how well we can do on a GPU. So this, is, uh, this would be like our kind of a theoretical target that we want to achieve with the GPU. So like we're looking at about a speed up of 7 to 8x. Let's see if we can achieve that. Now, I start off with uh, assigning a reference and a query uh, to each CUDA block inside, uh, the, uh, inside the GPU. And then from there onwards, I have a more fine-grained parallelism inside each block, where one alignment is performed per block. Now, first, I assign one CUDA thread to a unique column of the scoring matrix. And then it will be the responsibility of that CUDA thread to compute all the cells in that column. And the challenge here was to how to handle dependencies. Since we have a very convoluted sort of dependencies over here, each cell, like each thread, can calculate a cell only if its dependencies are ready. So for that, I use this 0 and 1 bit array. Now, if a thread is pointing towards a 0, that means its dependencies are not ready. But once it's pointing towards 1, that means it can go ahead and calculate uh, the cell assigned to it. And as we move forward, the array moves to right. And this shifting actually activates more thread as we go forward. And you can see that it works pretty well. And when we reach near the end, the anti-diagonals are try, uh, like again being compressed. And the parallelism is decreasing. And if you can imagine with me and uh, extrapolate this animation, you will see that uh, the CUDA threads start to become uh, be uh, like they get masked out when we reach near the end. So this strategy works out pretty well. And Another challenge in the scoring phase that I f faced was uh, of the non-coalescent memory excesses. If we are computing this green anti-diagonal, you can see that thread one is, uh, let's say thread one is cal calculating this cell, and two is right over here, and three is here. Then looking inside the memory layout, uh, we'll see that thread one and thread two are accessing memory locations which are about 200 bytes apart. And over here, considering that the length of the query sequence is about 100 uh, bases long. So cache line is 128 bytes long in GPU, and that means we are having a really uh, bad condition of non-coalescent memory excesses. So to solve that, I mapped these uh, anti-diagonals to the shared memory. Now, shared memory is a faster memory in the GPU, and it is a kind of a restricted resource. So we have to use it wisely. 
And I couldn't obviously store the complete DP metrics inside the shared memory arrays because it's, it's very scarce. So now let's try to focus on this particular cell and see that to compute this, I just basically need the green diagonal and the blue diagonal. I don't need anything before that. So effectively, I can discard a part of the uh, dynamic programming metrics. So I just store the two most uh, recent most diagonals and the current diagonal. So basically, I just need three shared memory arrays instead of storing the whole matrix inside the shared memory. So that's like killing two birds with the one stone. And I was able to uh, uh, like uh, rule out the non coalesced memory excesses and also uh, uh, utilize the shared memory in a better way. And uh, once we have the scoring matrix, the next phase is to find the highest scoring uh, cell. And uh, for that, I, each thread maintains a running maximum for its column. And at the end, then using warp shuffle reduction, I, do, I find the maximum. Now, warp shuffle is a method where uh, two threads of uh, GPU can exchange data using register to register memory transfers. Rather than going through the global memory or shared memory, they do a direct uh, memory transfer, uh, data transfer. And uh, once we have the maximum scoring cell, we perform a traceback. And for this version, I'm performing traceback using one single thread, and I mask out every other thread in the block. And one thread does the traceback using pointer jumping, uh, and then giving us the optimal alignment. But the traceback phase has another, uh, has another challenge as well. That is the storage of the traceback matrices. Now, in the picture, it looks pretty simple to store all these traceback errors. But in actual, we have to store two large matrices uh, which have like x and y coordinates of these pointers. Now, we cannot discard parts of this matrix just like we did for the scoring uh, matrix because we need to know all the uh, traceback paths. And uh, for that, obviously, we cannot use shared memory because shared memory is limited and we cannot store all these matrices inside shared memory. For that, I came up with this diagonal major indexing, uh, indexing strategy, which is reorganizing the data inside the GPU. And it, it, is, uh, it is not trivial because the size of the anti-diagonal is not consistent, and it changes across the metrics. And uh, using this method, I, with the use of a lookup table and an element offset, I'm able to access uh, every element of the diagonal in a completely coalesced manner. And uh, the diagonal offset basically provides the position where the diagonal starts, and the element offset gives me the location of the element inside the diagonal. Now, using all these optimizations, these are the results that I got. And you can see that it is really not close to what we were expecting. In fact, we are just like about two or three seconds faster uh, than the Haskell node. Now, keep in mind that this is just using one single V100 GPU on the Cori GPU nodes. So going ahead, uh, I tried to add a few more optimizations. And one of them was making use of warp shuffle more effectively. Now, in the scoring phase, as you might remember, I mapped the anti-diagonals to the shared memory. And basically, what was happening here was that different threads were sharing data using shared memory. Now, in fact, we could just use registers for that. Since we have this warp shuffle thing, which basically transfers data from one thread to the other using registers. Now, that obviously came with some problem. And that was, uh, so there were like some edge cases. Now, the sh warp shuffle method only works inside a warp. Uh, and warp is like a 32 thread wide thing inside the GPU. Now, if there is an interwarp data exchange, that would become a, yeah, like warp shuffle cannot work there. And for that, I made use of shared memory. So if there is like an interwarp sharing, uh, that has to go through shared memory. And there was another case of the phasing out threads. Now, using that one zero array, you might remember that certain threads were being masked out. And if, let's say, thread X wants to get value from thread Y, and thread Y has been phased out or masked out, then obviously uh, we need to go through shared memory. And for that, and for that the phasing out threads are going to spill their uh, values, uh, register values, to uh, the shared memory. And that works out nicely for this. Now, again, back to the traceback matrices. To give you an idea how large traceback matrices can be, for a typical alignment where the reference size is 1,024 bases long and the query size is 128 bases long, for one million alignment, uh, we need about 244 GBs of space just to store the traceback matrices. Now, V100 has just 16 GB of global, global memory. So obviously, that is a big problem. And the other challenge was the infliction of thread divergence penalty. Uh, when in the traceback phase, I masked out all the threads except one, I'm inflicting a huge thread divergence. And that's a really bad practice in GPU programming. 
So to mitigate all of this, I used the reverse scoring method. So this method was introduced in one of the uh, vector implementations of the same algorithm. So what they do is instead of, so after doing the scoring phase, uh, they f uh, the forward scoring phase, they find, uh, the maximum, starting from the maximum cell, they flip the threads. For example, in this case, I have the TGCA thread. I'll flip it to make ACGT and make a smaller scoring matrix and name it the reverse scoring matrix. And then use the same uh, method of warp shuffle data sharing that, that I used in the forward scoring phase. And uh, thus giving me the uh, starting coordinates of the alignment. Now, using these uh, uh, optimizations, I was able to get very close to our target, in fact, much better. And uh, so the shuffle kernel is here, is the one which makes use of warp shuffle, the register to register memory transfers, and it is about 10x faster, uh, I think 11x faster than the Haskell node and 10x faster than the shared memory kernel. So to check the, to see how it scales across multiple GPUs, I used a larger data set of 10 million alignments, and you can see that it scales pretty nicely. Going from one to two GPUs, the runtime is halved, then going from two to four, it is again halved, and going from four to eight, it's again halved. Now, uh, you can see that uh, using just one GPU, we were able to get like a 10x speed up over uh, one node, and uh, uh, imagine having multiple GPUs on a single node and having multiple nodes having multiple GPUs we are looking at a speed up of quite a magnitude, and using that uh, computational capability, we can definitely uh, challenge the bigger data sets that nobody has uh, tried before, and thus understand the microbial communities that we have never tried before. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, these computational approaches are going to open up a wealth of uh, information in this, uh, in this uh, uh, domain, and uh, in future, I plan to do a more uh, kind of a generic version of it, because right now this version is more specific for uh, uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, and it's, it's been implemented in CUDA. So I'm uh, uh, ch uh, like uh, trying out HIP and SICL for more uh, like uh, render GPUs and see how that works out. So, uh, so I would like to acknowledge the uh, Exabiome project. I think uh, Lenny is right over here. So uh, this work is in a collaboration with them uh, and NERSC. And, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take any questions and suggestions. Uh, for this, uh, this bar chart that had the scaling with GPUs, uh, it, is this just like an empirical measurement, or do you expect like a half? Uh, as you go up, uh, like, could you please repeat the question? Uh, for, for the bar chart that shows the scaling of nodes, is, is this just an empirical measurement, or did you is, is there a reason for that scaling? Uh, you said it goes down like like backward two. Yeah, so that's on single node of core GP, uh, GPU nodes, which has like eight GPUs, and I'm just like doubling the number of GPUs while keeping the data same. So, yeah. I, I mean, since you have like two times the compute capability, obviously, I mean, it's expected to go down that much, yeah. It was just to verify that there is like, a, the data transfer overheads are not too much. Okay, so yep. yeah, there's yeah. yeah, I mean, it's more computational bound, so, yeah. When you will uh, target uh, more and more uh, bigger programs, we need to do uh, communication between the different nodes, or can you split the matrix in such a way that there will be no need for communication? So uh, right now, I have like tested this in one of like a mini app sort of things, and uh, over that you're right, the bottleneck comes out to be the communication between different nodes. But we were able to almost the computational part was almost like disappearing when using GPU alignment. So yeah, that's another challenge, and obviously with the new hardware and. Uh, Maybe we'll, with some new optimization, we'll be able to tackle that, yeah. But that's, again, a different challenge than the GPU optimization. So for those last two bars, is, is that communication bump, like where not being Oh, so, so like from four to eight, you can see that it's almost halved. Oh, that's 16. Yeah, so that's six, yeah. Now, the eight GPU run has like about 1.6 second, which, is, which shouldn't be there, but that is because of the initialization cost. Uh, for some reason, when you increase the number of GPUs, uh, usage, there is a, a larger initialization cost uh, for the device. So yeah, that is a thing that we are discussing with NVIDIA, but since it's very small compared to the complete run, it's not very significant. 
Okay, I guess we'll take uh, another 10-minute break. Thank you very much.